that simple. I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 14 through 21 today. Every morning as you're making your way there, our family spends time together in worship. We, we sing a couple of songs, we pray, we uh, open up the Word, and it's without a doubt the most important thing that we do as a family together every single day. And uh, I want to highly encourage you to do that with your children, to do that with the young ones in your life. If you're here today as a fall of Christ, spend some time as a family doing something around the Word of God, singing, praise, and praying together. But in our devotion yesterday, one of our secondary verses reminded us that we were purchased with an extremely high price through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit drew us unto salvation, our old lives were exchanged for new ones. And now the Spirit of God dwells within us. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Now listen to these powerful words. You are not your own. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now the context of this passage to the church of Corinth is talking about sexual purity. But notice the words, you are not your own. What Paul is conveying here, in other words, is he's saying, I am no longer in control of my life. God is. You, as a follower of Jesus Christ, are no longer in control of your life. God is. Our lives are not our own. I do not own my life. You do not own your life. And if I am not my own, then guess what else is not mine? My time. I do not own my time. God owns my time. I do not own my money. It belongs to God. I do not own my home. It belongs to God and my landlord. <laughs> my children are not my own. Do you get what Paul's saying here? He's saying we, we don't own anything as far as Jesus Christ. Our lives belong to God. John Piper is a pastor and theologian out of Minnesota. And he says this, and I quote, One of the great uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove at the last day that prayerlessness was not from lack of time. We waste so much of God's resources. We waste His time. We waste His money. We invest our time into a lot of things that if we're being honest with ourselves have no eternal value. But how do you know if you're investing in eternity? I've shared this with you many years ago, but the wife of one of my seminary professors used to say that there are three items you can do each day that will make an eternal kingdom impact. Number one, you could read your Bible. You cannot go wrong with learning more about God and His plan for your life. And I'm going to highly encourage you today, church. If you are not consistently daily in the Word of God, make today the day that you are going to determine to be in the Word of God. There's a couple things about spiritual disciplines. If you do not plan to be in the Word of God, you will not be in the Word of God. If you just aimlessly say, well, I'll read my Bible when I feel like it or when I want to, whatever it may be, you'll never consistently grow in the Word of God. Read your Bible. You cannot go wrong with reading your Bible. Secondly, you can invest into others. If you want to make a lasting impact on eternity, then you can pour your life into other people. Start out talking about family worship time. You can pour into your kids every day. That's never a waste of time. The Bible commands us to go and to make disciples. You can, you should be, and as a follower of Christ, you have been commanded by Jesus to make disciples. Gather group, 
grow in stages. If you want to know more about that, go to disciplemakingstages.com. Learn how to invest into others. If you're not doing so, this isn't okay. This isn't something that we just say, well, that's not a big deal. No, we should be spending our time making disciples. And thirdly, what we're talking about today, you can pray. You can pray. It is never a waste of time to read the Word of God. It is a never a waste of time to make disciples. And it is never a waste of time to spend it in prayer, to pray. Last week, we started a two-part sermon entitled, How to Have a Powerful Prayer Life. And at the heart of this sermon is to ask the question, how can we make Christ central to everything we do in our lives through prayer? Now, I want to just give us a quick review so that we're reminded exactly where we are going today. First, we saw last week that in order to have a powerful prayer life, we must pray with the right motivation. Verse 14 and 15 of Ephesians 3 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. When we pray, in other words, we must go before God with the right motive. Prayer is not so much about what we can get, but about who we want to be with in God. He says, I bow my knees before the Father. Our motivation is a posture of humility just to be in the presence of God. That's why we pray. When we pray, it must be more about God and His reverence and praise and honor for Him than it is about just trying to get what we want or what we need from God. Secondly, we saw that to have a powerful prayer life, we must pray from the proper power source. If you haven't figured it out yet, as Christ followers, we're not going to get very far in our prayer life if we're trying to pray in our own strength and in our own might instead of through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the problem is a lot of Christians, when they talk about the Trinity that we just sung about, that O'Day led us, we, we reference the Trinity, we think of the Trinity in our mind as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. But that's not true. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God has gifted to us the power of the Holy Spirit to pray with real power. Verse 16, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner person, in the inner man. You need the power of the Holy Spirit if you want to have a powerful prayer life. And thirdly, we saw that we must pray with a totally surrendered heart to Christ. If you want to have a powerful prayer life today, you must pray with a totally surrendered heart to Christ so that Christ may dwell, he writes in verse 17, in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love so that Christ may dwell. We must be totally surrendered to Jesus Christ if we want to have a powerful prayer life each day. We cannot hold anything back when we pray before the Lord. Let me give you a quick example of what that could look like. You've got sin in your life. You're harboring sin. It's known sin. And yet you believe that you can still go before the Lord and have a strong prayer life while continuing this sin. It doesn't align with the Word of God. Over the years, a lot of people will say, well, I feel this way, Pastor, or I feel that way. Your feelings don't matter. What matters is what the Word of God says. And if you have no sin in your life and you think that you're going to keep growing in your relationship with the Lord, we're fooling ourselves. Because we have broken fellowship before a righteous, holy, perfect God if there's no sin that we will not and refuse to repent and confess of. Does that make sense today? Okay, so today what I want us to do is I want us to look at the final two steps in how to have a powerful prayer life. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19a for our next key. It says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Here's our next step to have a powerful prayer life. 
You and I want to have a powerful prayer life. We must daily ask God for a sense to comprehend His love. We must ask God to give us a, a sense, an understanding to comprehend His love. Being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. You see, church, we should be praying on a regular basis that we would acquire a sense to comprehend the love of Christ Jesus. Now, this is not some sort of intellectual information that we should ask the Lord for. Sense here means to grasp the meaning of, to understand. In other words, we should daily ask the Lord to help us to grasp His love, to get a hold of how much He loves us. But how do we do that? Because I don't know about you, but there are many days in my life when I don't feel very lovable. Can I get a witness? Yeah. <laughs> I have a bad attitude. I haven't spent time with the Lord like I should have that day. I've been unkind to other people, mistreating loved ones, and the list could go on and on and on. We don't feel very lovable each day. Oftentimes, we don't feel like anyone will want to love us, let alone the Creator of the universe. But what do we do? Do we retreat back into our emotions? Do we retreat back into our feelings? No, we stand upon the truth of the Word of God. How do we begin to comprehend the love of Jesus Christ? Studying this passage... There is an incredible threefold progression here in these verses about the love of Jesus. And I want us to look at them today. First, look at verse 17. It says that Christ dwells in our hearts by what, church? By faith. By faith. Now, there has been a lot of times throughout the years where I've shared the gospel with people. And they always want to make it an intellectual debate. They always want to say, but yeah, but there's this religion or there's that religion. Or how can I really know? How can I really know? I mean, after all, I wasn't there at Golgotha 2,000 years ago. When you clear the table, when you push all your chips into the middle, you have to come to a faith decision. None of us saw Christ raised from the dead. But we know by faith because the Spirit of God has revealed to us that this is not just some story we read about in an ancient book, but it's fact. And it's fact, it's truth, but it's faith. It's faith that we come to know this love. We may not know everything about Christianity and the Bible, especially in the beginning. So many new Christians get so discouraged thinking that they should know all these things about Scripture and they should know this and know that. And, and God forbid, sometimes churches make people feel terrible when they're new in their faith. Oh, you, should, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. It takes time. That's what discipleship is about. That's what we talked about earlier. We should be making disciples. But Paul says in verse 17, by faith we know this love. By faith, we believe that Jesus Christ is indeed the Savior of the world. That He died on the cross and He rose from the grave. We believe that by faith. So Christ lives in us. He dwells in us by faith. Let me just say this before we move on to the second thing. I want to be very, very clear who does that work. It is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit of God. Why does this person believe in your family and this person refuses to believe? Rejects God over and over and over again. And what we got to do, we got to be careful as Christians because we start to think it's got something to do with us. Well, I'm just not sharing the gospel well enough. I don't know enough about apologetics. I don't know how to defend against this world religion or that world religion. Listen to me. God has told us to make disciples that make disciples. God has called us to share the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. But you know what God has not called us to do? You know what's impossible for you to do? You know what's impossible for me to do? We cannot make people believe. 
We cannot make people have this faith. Now, I wish we could. God help me, I wish we could. But don't get your role twisted and don't get your role confused with the role of the Holy Spirit of God. Faithfulness is what we've been called to. How can we know this love? Through faith. Secondly, look at the end of verse 17. Paul says that because Christ dwells in us by faith, we are rooted and we are grounded in love. So now, because we have believed on Jesus Christ by faith, and He dwells in us, we have this guiding principle in our lives called love. We are rooted and we are grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of things today that people are trying to root and ground themselves in. And they will not hold. They will not hold. They are quickly fading. They are quickly fleeing. But the anchor, as the song says, always holds. The anchor of Jesus Christ. And this love is rooted and grounded in those who believe in Jesus Christ. We are motivated by love. We are focused on love. We are, as Paul says, rooted and grounded in love. That's why Jesus says you cannot hate and have my love. We need to be reminded that love is what should lead us, what should guide us on a regular daily basis, modeling and demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ. There is so much fighting taking place today. Have you noticed this church? Arguing, bickering, fighting. I mean, you know it's a crazy world when Canadians are fighting in grocery stores. Can I get a witness? I mean, like, when, when you see people arguing about anything and everything, all of the time, so much discord. Arguing on social media. Arguing in marriages. Arguing in homes. Arguing at work. Fighting constantly. As Christ followers... Paul says to focus on love and not be so concerned with always having to have your point heard. I want to be very clear. The most loving thing we can do is tell people the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not very loving. As a matter of fact, I, in fact, I, I would say it's hate-filled. To tell somebody that they can believe in a false god or a false idol and they'll be right with God someday and they'll go to heaven. I believe it is not love but it is hatred when you tell people that they can live their lives based upon Satan's schemes and their feelings and their emotions instead of what God commands in Scripture and everything's going to be fine and God up in heaven loves them and cares about them and is for them and all those things. You do you, you be happy. That is not love. That is not love. That is hate. The most loving thing we can do as Christ followers is graciously teach people the truth of the Word of God and live out our lives differently. But that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about being so concerned and being so consumed with always having your way, always getting what you want, and the only way that I can possibly swallow my pride, the only way that I can possibly humble myself and demonstrate love properly is if I am rooted in love. If I am being led and guided by the love of Jesus Christ. So, Christ dwells in us. How? Faith. Through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, by faith we believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and this love. Grounded and rooted in love. And what is the end result of these three steps? Look at verses 18 and 19. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. A sense to comprehend the love of Jesus Christ. I don't want to confuse anybody here today. Because you may see verse 19 and say, but Matt, Paul says that the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. 
How can we possibly understand it? Paul isn't saying that we cannot gain a sense to comprehend the love of Christ. But what he is saying is rather that we will never fully understand all the ways in which Jesus loves us. It's like your child. You tell them I love you. But they don't know you die for them, do they? It's like the person that you love and you, you say I, I love you. I care about you. But maybe they don't know the sacrifice or the, the willingness that you would go to for them. Friends, this love that we're talking about today is at the root and at the foundation of a powerful prayer life. Boys and girls, do you remember what our video said about the kind of love God has for us? That video said he loves us when we feel left out. Raise your hand if you've ever felt left out. Raise your hand. And I've felt left out before. Hey, raise your hand if you've ever felt alone. You ever felt alone? It says he loves us when we feel left out, alone. Raise your hand if you've ever felt hurt. You ever felt hurt? You ever had your feelings hurt? Man, we can be so sensitive, can't we, sometimes? But nonetheless, we get our feelings hurt. That video said he loves us when we feel left out, alone, or hurt. He loves us even when we do wrong things. It is the strongest, most powerful, never changing, always and forever kind of love. Man, that's the gospel. God doesn't love you based upon what you've done. God doesn't love you based upon what you can do for him. God loves you because his son Jesus died on the cross and rose three days later. And the only way you and I can be reconciled with the righteous, holy, perfect God is through the powerful, precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's love. That's love. And the only way we can comprehend it, the only way we can understand it, it's through the Spirit. And no matter what we do, that video said, His love will always be with us. Man, don't cave into your feelings. Don't cave into your emotions. Don't be like the Eeyore of the old Winnie the Pooh cartoons. Nobody likes me. Nobody loves me. Nobody wants me. We all feel that way sometimes, don't we? But know this, God loves you. A sense to comprehend the love of Christ in our prayer lives. So important. So important. You say, Matt, why is it so important? Because when we begin to comprehend the love that Jesus Christ has for us, it will take our prayer lives to the next level. You know why? Because like we talked about last week, we'll just, be, we'll, we'll just want to be with Him. When we understand how much He loves us and what He's done for us, We'll just want to be with Him. You'll find yourself praying in the car. You'll find yourself praying in the shower. You'll find yourself praying in the Spirit at work. You'll find yourself praying and praising Him all the day long when the Spirit begins to reveal to you and give you a sense to comprehend the love of Christ. Sense to comprehend the love of Christ in our prayer lives. So important. Our last and fifth step in this two-part series. In order to have a powerful prayer life, we must find satisfaction in Christ alone. Satisfaction in Christ alone. Ephesians 3, 19b. That you may be filled up. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. I love coffee, and uh, I've had a love-hate relationship, maybe addiction with caffeine for most of my adult life, so I have to be careful with how much of it I drink. Just trying to be honest with you today. But when I'm, every morning nearly, I make a French press, and I put boiling water on the stove. And if I'm not careful, if I walk away, it just starts boiling over, right? And it gets all over the stove, and it gets wet, and all those kinds of things. That's the image that the Lord brought to my mind when I read this today. That you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. You ever heard the expression, fool's gold? Fool's gold? We've all heard that expression. It's very popular. 
We've heard that many times. But have you ever thought about where it comes from? The gold rush of 1849, it spurred some 24,000 people down in the states to the west coast of California. They migrated there. And they all were looking for gold. And within the six years of mining, from 1949 to, or 1849 to 1855, it, it was attributed to that period some $14 billion worth of gold by today's economic standards was extracted from that area. People were coming upon economic freedom through all the natural resources of, of that gold. But what happened over time? The resources were depleted. There was no more gold. But then a cruel joke happened. A mineral called pyrite, P-Y-R-I-T-E, it was discovered. And it has absolutely no value at all, but it looks just like gold. And people were wasting resources and money and all these things trying to mine for gold. And all they were finding was this fool's gold. People wasted time and resources and effort in its pursuit. I want to tell you today, there is a spiritual fool's gold. There is a spiritual fool's gold in our world today. And just like what we saw in that video, the moment Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, this fool's gold fell onto this planet like you could not possibly imagine. Because we see it all throughout Scripture, this fool's gold. You say, what is fool's gold? We're taught to believe that if we just had more money, then everything would be alright in our lives. We'd be truly happy. And so we get a little more money, but we're not satisfied. We're led to believe that if we could just find the perfect person to marry, then we would just be satisfied and we'd have a great life. And then we get married and we're like, wait, you're not perfect at all. Because nobody perfect exists in this world. We think to ourselves, if I just had a better job, my life would be so much better. If I could just get that promotion, my life would be so much better. If I could just get that house, my life would be so much better. If I could just get that new car, my life would be so much better. And you fill in the blank. But I'm here to tell you today, based upon the authority of the Word of God, it's all fool's gold. Because nothing will satisfy like Jesus Christ will satisfy. Nothing will satisfy your soul like the Messiah. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the Samaritan woman at the well with Jesus. There's an account in John chapter 4 verses 10 through 18. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. She still thinks he's talking about water. She still thinks he's talking about something to quench her physical, parched throat. But Jesus says to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, you've correctly said I have no husband. For you've had five and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. What were we just talking about a few moments ago? The most loving thing you can do is to tell people the truth of the Word of God. That's love. Jesus doesn't just play games with this woman. Jesus tells her what her problem is. Jesus confronts her with what her sin is. What is her sin? She was trying to find her value in the opposite sex. She was trying to find her value in men. And ladies, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'll tell you right now, we make terrible gods. We make terrible idols. And men, if you haven't figured it out yet, 
women make terrible goddess. They make terrible idols. You know why? Because no one will satisfy like Christ can satisfy. And if you do not have your satisfaction in Christ alone, nothing in this life will be aligned as it ought to be in your life. You can drive nice cars. You can have a big bank account. You can have all the things that you think you need and you think that you want and you think will make you happy. If your joy and satisfaction is not in Christ alone, you will never have true purpose. You say, Matt, that's great. But what does that have to do with having a powerful prayer life? Because you see, we don't pray just to receive something. We don't pray just to be healed. We don't pray just to see revival. We don't pray just for this. We don't pray just for that. We pray just to be with Him because He alone satisfies our soul. He alone satisfies our soul. There's a song we used to sing all the time in church growing up. I want to read to you just a line. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares to you. Do you know why your prayer life is not as it ought to be today? Because you desire other things more than you desire Him. Your prayer life is not the way it ought to be today because you desire other things, other people, more than you desire Christ. We can try to be, you know, figure this out and say this and say that. The proof is in the pudding. We invest our time in the things we love the most. We spend our money on the things we love the most. Why don't people tithe on a regular basis? Why don't people pray on a regular basis? Why don't people read the Word on a regular basis? Because they are not satisfied in Christ alone. What would happen in our church? What would happen in the universal church if prayer became Central. Let me ask you a question this afternoon, church, as we close. What is competing with God in your life? What's competing with God? If we don't pray and we don't have a powerful prayer life because we are not satisfied in Christ alone, then we have to ask the next logical question. What is competing with Christ for that sufficient location at the top of our lives? What is? Is it work? Is it entertainment? Is it fun? I can't answer that question for you. You have to answer that question. What is it? But when we start to do the hard work and the Holy Spirit shows us what is competing with our primary affection, that ought to be Christ Jesus. That same love we've been talking about today, He'll give to you. He'll give to you as you repent. He'll give to you as you seek His power to make Him the primary affection in your life. He'll give you that love. You see, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going anywhere. And He doesn't change. So today, the first step we have to say is if I am not truly satisfied in Christ, number one, what am I finding my satisfaction in? And then number two, we've got to ask God to give us the strength to make Him the number one affection in our lives. What would happen in our lives if we began to pray with power? 
Paul answers the question for us in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, be all that we ask, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. When we make prayer central in our lives, when we pray with power, Paul says that Christ will do more than we could ever possibly imagine. People will be healed. Souls will be saved. Relationships will be restored. Churches will be planted. Marriages will thrive. Churches will explode in physical and spiritual growth. God's people will get serious about God's commands. When we pray, powerful things happen. And best of all, you know what happens when we prioritize prayer? Paul tells us again. He says that God will be glorified in our lives. That's the most important thing. That He would once again control and reign in our hearts. How can we have a powerful prayer life? We must pray with the right motivation. We must pray from the proper power source, the Holy Spirit. We must pray with a totally surrendered heart to Christ, not leaving anything back. We must pray with a sense to comprehend the love of Christ daily. And finally, we must pray with satisfaction in Christ alone. And when we pray with these five virtues, King Jesus will be glorified and Christ will do far more than we could ever possibly imagine for His glory and for His honor. Soul searching today, church. We must ask God to search us like David prayed in the Psalms. Search our hearts, O oh God. We must ask the Holy Spirit in this time of prayer to search our hearts. Maybe you're here today. You've never repented of your sins. You've never trusted in Christ Jesus alone as your Lord and Savior. Man, you're trying to find satisfaction in everything this world has to offer. And nothing will ever satisfy. Nothing will ever satisfy. Rockefeller, at the height of his wealth, was asked, how much more money do you need? And he said, just a little bit more. And that's what you're always going to think. I just need more of this. I just need more of that. We don't need more of this world. We need to truly surrender ourselves to Christ. Today, if you want to do that, you can repent of your sins, place your trust and faith in Him alone. But if you're here today and you are born again, you know Christ is your Lord and Savior. Answer that question that I posed to you just a moment ago. Is your satisfaction in Christ is he the object of your affection? Or is he just on a list a few rows down? That's never acceptable in our lives. So whatever the Lord's teaching us, whatever the Lord's showing us today, as we enter into a time of corporate prayer, let's obey him. Let's seek out his plans. Let's seek out his will for our lives.